We're in the middle of a pretty important crisis in the United States. It's a crisis around the basic corruption of our government. The only way we're going to attack and to change that corruption is to build these grassroots movements. The thing that's fantastic about Occupy DC is that Occupy DC from the very beginning has focused on what I think is the real root problem that has explained and, and made sensible the whole Occupy movement, and that is the relationship between money and politics. about this conference and what may make it different than, than others is that we, we have a, having some genuine left-right dialogue about these really critical structural issues that, that are, are all about our democracy. We think that we really need to shift our campaign system from large donors, special interest, to a citizen-driven, small donor system. And that will accomplish a couple of things. I think it will allow more people, different kinds of people, a more diverse group of people to run and serve in public office, particularly Congress. And I think it will create more of an uh, atmosphere of decision making and policy making that is based on the merits of whatever is being discussed, not what money and what special interests are involving themselves in the discussion. Do you think any politician cares what the voters think generally compared to what the big checks think? It's corrupt when you live in a town where at the head of every line is the biggest check. And a woman with a good idea, a family with a dream that could put America to work, they don't think God. I'm telling you, the older I get, the more I realize the danger of silence. Uh, this is a, uh, it should not be a partisan issue, this really should be an American issue and I think that uh, folks that are, find themselves on the political left, on the political right and in the political middle can unite to talk about these issues and to find common ground. That's really what we need to do because this common ground does exist. I'm going to start by laying out how we have to think about this problem and end by saying what I think we need to do. So here's the problem. It is quite simple. This institution is corrupt. It is not corrupt in a brown paper bag sense of corrupt. It's not corrupt in a Rod Lagojevich sense of corrupt. It's not corrupt in any criminal sense. Indeed, I want to stipulate that there's practically no criminal activity in what I'm talking about at all. Or another way of putting that, if we eliminated every single criminal, we would not have changed this problem at all. Here's the problem. Congress has evolved a different dependence. Not just a dependence upon the people, but increasingly a dependence upon the funders. As members spend between 30 and 70% of their time raising money to get back to Congress to get their party back to power, they develop, as any of us would, a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shape shifters. As they constantly adjust their views, not on issues 1 to 10, but on issue 11 to 1,000, in light of what they know will raise money. That belief erodes trust in this institution of Congress. Gallup found last year that 11% of Americans had confidence in Congress. They then said it went up to 12%. New York Times said it was actually 9% of Americans who have confidence in Congress. 9%. There is certainly more percentage of people who believed in the British crown at the time of the revolution than who believe in this Congress today. Citizens United has made it so the single thing incumbents are most worried about is that 30 days before the election, some super PAC will come in and then drop a million dollars on the other side. So what does the incumbent do in the face of that threat? Well, just to reframe what he said a little bit to make it a little bit more clear, what the incumbent does is the incumbent tries to buy super PAC insurance. So what's super PAC insurance? It's insurance so that when somebody comes in and drops a bomb on one side, your insurers come in and drop a bomb on the other side to kind of balance it out, to make it so that the effect of the super PAC money is not to 
decisive. So how do you buy insurance? Well, you all know this. You pay your premium in advance. You pay your premium long before you need the insurance company to come in and make their payment in the face of the event they're trying to insure against. And the event they're trying to insure against is somebody coming in and dropping a million dollars on the other side. And how do you pay your premium if you're a senator in advance? Well, you talk to groups who say things like, well, we'd like to help you, Senator, but we can only support people who support us at least 80% of our support card. So long before the election, long before any money is spent, long before any super PAC appears on the other side, senators and representatives are deciding how to vote in light of what they need to do in order to guarantee that the rich people on their side will step up if they are threatened. The average salary increase for a representative leading to become a lobbyist 1,452%, 0.26%, one quarter of 1% of Americans give more than $200 in a congressional election. 0.05% max out to any congressional candidate. 0.01%, the 1% of the 1%, give more than $10,000 in any election cycle. And 0.000063%, 196 Americans have given 80% of the money spent by super PACs in this presidential election so far. But the question is by whom will these campaigns be funded? And the first way to answer that question is to decide between citizens or non-citizens who should be funded these campaigns non-citizens like the Chinese, the French, or whether or not corporations are persons, no one has ever said they are citizens of the United States. So should it be non-citizens who are funding elections or citizens? And when framed like that, overwhelmingly, Americans say, of course, it should be citizens. But if it's citizens, which citizens should be funding campaigns? Some citizens or all citizens? We have a system where the 1% per capita contribution is 10 times the per capita contribution of the 99%. Now, you should step back from this and think, this is kind of weird. Could we run a government like this? You know, if you think about elections in the United States, every cycle, there's at least two very different kinds of elections that happen. One kind of election is the voter election, where people go out and vote. The second kind of election is the money election, where people every single day decide whether they're going to send their money to candidates so that the candidates can use that money to get people to vote. All right, now our Constitution has been interpreted to say that in the voting election, we have to be almost precisely equal. That if you have a district drawn so that the concentration of voting power in that district is even 0.1% different from the concentration of voting power in the district next to it, the Constitution requires we redraw the lines to make sure that the effect of votes is exactly the same. That's the value of equality when it comes to votes. But when it comes to money, there is no principle of equality at all, permitting radically different influence on the basis of your opportunity to use money to influence elections. So these citizen-funded elections by a small segment of our citizens have produced elections funded by the tiniest slice of the 1%, which is exactly the picture the progressives gave us of elections 100 years ago. And so when I talk about citizen-funded elections, obviously, I don't mean to talk about that. But that leads people to the opposite extreme, where they say, okay, we all should fund elections. And the simplest way to fund the elections for all of us would be something like the Federal Election Commission's public funding of presidential election system, where we just get a bunch of money from the federal government and give it out to fund elections. Now this system, interestingly, is generally hated by Americans. Some think it's arbitrary, the numbers are arbitrary. Some on the right in particular say, there's something wrong with my money being used to subsidize your speech. And most people look at it and think it's kind of bloated bureaucratic mess that doesn't really reflect anything fundamental or important about what democracies or elections should be about. So I want to 
to say, when I'm talking about citizen funded elections, I'm also not talking about that. I'm not talking about the Federal Election Commission's public funding of elections. What I'm talking about is a system where all people fund elections, but the decisions about how to fund elections are driven from the bottom up, not the top down. And these are the systems that Nick Nyhart was talking about in the panel before. These are voluntary, small dollar funded campaigns. Systems that allow candidates to opt into a system where they take small dollar contributions only, and the system amplifies those small dollar contributions. Go talk to the NRA about this idea. <laughs> and begin to recognize every single membership organization would look at something like a voucher program as an extremely effective way to make it so that their members would have a more effective way to participate in the politics of their system. Because, of course, even in a system where you can give $100, the vast majority of Americans don't have $100 to give in political campaigns. They have $100 to pay their rent, they hope, but not necessarily to give in their political campaigns. So the politics of a voucher program is to extend all the way across the spectrum of Americans, the opportunity to participate in the political system in a way that politicians would care to respond to. So where do you think they focus their attention? But in a voucher system, they would focus their attention all the way across, because all the way across, there is a potential resource to get into their political campaign. That's what I think we have to mean by citizen-funded elections. A system where everyone is participating from the bottom up. Only citizens are participating, but all citizens are participating. And that's the way to get back this idea of a democracy dependent upon the people alone. Now, is it enough, given the non-citizen funded super PACs or citizen funded campaigns? But obviously, we see it's not enough. Super PACs have redefined the character of campaigns. We've entered the age of the super PAC, not just happy super PACs like Colbert super PACs, but super PACs that evoke more a Tony Soprano. The corruption here is corruption relative to what the framers of our Constitution thought they were giving us. As Nick Nyhart described it, the framers of our Constitution gave us what they call a republic. And by a republic, they meant a representative democracy. And by a representative democracy, as Federalist 52 puts it, they meant a democracy that would have a branch of government that would be dependent upon the people alone. This is why I think it's so important not to think that the fight we are having is a fight about Citizens United. Because on January 20th, 2009, the day before Citizens United was decided, our democracy was already dead. Citizens United shot the body, but the body was already cold. So any movement that aims to just reverse Citizens United and no more is not a movement that's going to solve the problems we face. So while I agree we have to overturn Citizens United, I think we should recognize that it's a much bigger fight we have. And I would overturn Citizens United quite directly. Not in these magic bullet words of whether money is speech or corporations or persons, quite directly. I would say Congress has the power that Citizens United says they don't have. To limit, I don't think they should have the power to ban speech by anyone. So I would say limit independent political expenditures within 90 days of the election, whether it's 90 or 120, I don't know what those numbers are. But the point is there's a period of time where we should be able to silence the noise, non-citizen noise and allow citizens to hear campaigns talk to citizens. Number one, we have to guarantee, and I would do it constitutionally, as we suggested in the last question before, we have to guarantee in a constitution that elections are publicly funded, and the way I would do it is the way I've described, and number two, I would guarantee that we have the power to limit independent expenditures. And in this respect, I'm extremely proud to come and speak to the Occupy DC group, which passed a resolution misreported by everybody that is the only resolution I think that has been passed in the Occupy movement that made these two elements central to what reform has to be. We can't let this issue go dark in this presidential election. If we go through this presidential election without this becoming the focal point of the debate, then we will have had two election cycles 
where the tiniest slice of the 1% have bought the elections. And when those two cycles have passed, most Americans will just accept this is the way democracy is. They will accept the pat down of American democracy that guarantees that the rich can buy their results is just what we have, and there's nothing that can be done about it. Okay, here's the final point. I go around and speak way too much about this issue. Way too much. And the overwhelming response I get is a response similar to a response I got when I gave a speech at Dartmouth. And I finished, and a woman stood up and she said, Professor, you've convinced me absolutely that it's impossible to fix this problem. <laughs> Completely impossible. And I write about this in my book. I, at that moment, I had this image come to my head um, about his brother, his eight-year-old brother. And I thought, um, so imagine a doctor came to me and said, your son has terminal brain cancer. And there's nothing you can do. It's impossible for us to deal with this. And I thought, would I, would I do nothing? Just accept it. And that thought led me to a recognition about what love means. What is love? Love is the willingness, the commitment to act in the face of impossibility because of that love. It's the willingness to do whatever it takes regardless of the probability. And when I had that recognition about my son, I had that recognition about this democracy. Because we on the left love this country too. We on the left believe in the ideals that have been spoken by our founders from throughout our time, Martin Luther King, as much as James Madison. We love this country too. And so when the reasonable, rational person stands up and says, it's impossible, The response of those who love is, it's irrelevant whether it's impossible. It's irrelevant whether it's impossible. Honored, but I implore you to take the steps to do it.